Okay, so welcome everyone to the RL Theory Seminar. I've shared the slides for the talk in the chat. Should be visible to everyone. Um, so today we have Roberto presenting and just uh, some logistics for anyone new. The way these seminars work is we have about a 50 minute presentation, that's five zero. And during the presentation, you can just unmute and ask any questions you'd like. If you want, you can also just ask in the chat and I will unmute and ask the speaker for you. Also at the end of the talk, there's gonna be like a longer Q&A which you can ask your longer questions. So if you have something more technical, maybe wait till the end of the talk. Um, otherwise, that's all the logistics I have to say. So um, today, we, as I said, we have Roberto presenting and Roberto is a last year PhD candidate in engineering and computer science at La Sapienza University of Rome. And his research mainly focuses on reinforcement learning in environments with non-Markovian non dynamics and on hierarchical RL. So with that, you can get started. Great, thanks for having me today. So um, the paper I'll be presenting is being accepted on NURPS so this year. And it's joint work together with um, Anders Johnson, Alessandro Ronca, and Sadeg Talebi, and some of them are in the call right now. So let's understand um, the content of the work from the title. So this is probably efficient offline reinforcement learning in regular decision processes. So we really understand that we are doing um, offline reinforcement learning, so estimating near optimal policies from data but in a special class of um, decision processes that are regular. So this will be RDPs for short. So in the presentation, I'll need to spend some time explaining what this model is, how it works, the basic intuitions, um, and this is necessary to understand how the algorithm works as well. Then I'll explain um, the algorithm reg or for regular offline reinforcement learning. Then I'll show the two sample complexity hyperbounds bounds that we have on the um, required data set size. And we have a sample complexity lower bound as well. So let's get started. First, I want to motivate with you why we care about no Markovian decision processes, but that's quite easy for me because mm, the situation comes up uh, quite often in um, interesting environments actually. A first cause of non-Markovian dependency is based on um, explicit dependency on past events. So for example, we might consider this um, toy example. The agent starts at S, it receives a top observation, a bottom observation, and based, based on this observation, the goal will be placed at the top cell or the bottom one. So there's this, there's this dependency between the first observation and the position of the goal and the associated reward. Of course, the agent doesn't know that this dependency exists, so it must learn that the first observation is relevant for the final goal. And this is a dependency on observations, but we came up, um, we can write environments with dependencies on actions. Um, they work basically the same. For example, we might say an agent should be only rewarded when entering a restricted area if it asked for permission before. So that's a dependency on past actions. These are explicit dependencies, but we can have no Markovian environments, even though we have, uh, even when we have partial observations. So if we are in a POMDP, we have also a no Markovian environment. In this uh, Minecraft domain, the agent can um, move in this cell. Yes, Chavo? Yeah, you, you can also finish the sentence. It's not. Yeah, but I uh, mean, it's quite an. Sure, sure. Uh, I just generally wondering about whether you are going to define what you mean by a Markovian environment, since yeah. we are talking a lot about the non-Markovian environments yes. before the Markovian <laughs> environments are de defined. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. I'll do. I'll do it in the next slide. But basically, um, there's a dependency on the past observation. So here, if the agent knew the cell it occupies that information would be enough to predict the next observation and reward. Uh, but from the left image, the agent might get confused in which cell it occupies. Um, 
Now, if we want to formalize this environment, we need to talk about entire traces of interaction and, he, and um, sequences of observations, actions, and rewards uh, will be in the finite horizon setting. So we consider um, age transitions exact, exactly. Now, um, no Markovian, that means that it doesn't respect the Markov assumptions in either observations or rewards. So the next observation or reward may depend on the first events, actions and observations, even though uh, the last tuple is given to the agent. So essentially, the agent must condition on the first uh, of the entire history in general, because that's necessary information, because the last one is not enough to predict. So we'll use this object a lot and uh, we'll give it a name. This for us is a history. So. Um, the sequence of actions is observations from the start up to the current moment. Now, if for formalizing no Markovian decision processes, we will have um, a similar transition function as in MDPs and reward function with stochastic outputs, but the input will be the history in general. So entire sequences. In this work, we assume that uh, we are in a tabular setting because that's a complex uh, situation enough. And values are defined as usual. So we are doing expected sum of rewards uh, as for MDPs. However, the conditioning is for uh, is over history. So values are functions over histories and policies are also functions over histories. So near, near optimality is defined as usual, uh, no changes here. We are now ready to define what an RDP is. And basically, it's a decision process where the transition function and the reward functions are regular. Before I get too into that, it's better if I answer questions now. Yeah. It, it's just a terminology question about observations. Rewards mm -hmm. are also observed. Are they? Um, not in the sense that the agent can make conditioning on them. They don't in this sense, uh, so okay. they are only used for evaluation. We make this choice to be consistent. So the rewards are not observed. Okay, yeah, no. yeah. so that, that's okay. Um, we might so say that they are not, not the observation. Okay. Yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is to be consistent with the pom DLP literature, where they usually aren't. Um, if we need to condition on them, we, maybe we place it in the observations as well. Yeah, I think that pump depilators is so inconsistent about this. And that's yeah, one of I the agree. It's absolutely I agree. That's a free not free choice. Yeah. But it's like, right, like it's like there is a symmetry and asymmetry with the rewards and observations because the Markovian property or like whether the Markovian property holds or not is demanded both for the reward and observation, uh, but the rewards are not observed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it should act like a, okay, so this, if the observation space is anything, then you could say that like observations can always include the rewards. It's like there is no, it is a more general way of modeling things than if you assume that the rewards are observed. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, they could be observed. Like we could say rewards are always in the observation, so this formalism would also work. Uh, okay, no, I'm not trying to insist on that, but yeah, but they're okay. trying. But they distinguish usually, so we it, it will be though a little bit hard to learn if nothing else is known, uh, and the rewards are not observed. But like you will get to that. I'm sure mm -hmm. that we'll figure out something. Okay, so um. This is a transition function. The general one can have arbitrary dependency. RDPs, the models we learn on, are actually a subclass of these environments where we make an assumption on these transitions to the reward functions, um, where these ones should be of a specific type. And the definition says that T and R should be regular. What does it mean? Uh, we should think about regularity in the meaning of regular languages. So. TNR gives us the uh, distribution over next observations and rewards. And which one we select, with the distribution that we select, 
can be decided basically um, based on the truth of some regular expression. So there's a history of things we can condition on. We evaluate some regular expression over it. And we can decide which output distribution we generate. This means that we can construct um, a funny state transducers that computes T and R. In fact, in this work, we'll use a Moore machine representation where we have automaton states, input symbols, and transition functions as for any finite state automaton, and two output functions over the states. Now, the output function, given a state and action, tells us the nested distributions over um, observations and rewards. So um, we generate an observation and a reward with this function. The observation is fed back into the transition function together with the action we executed. And that's how the automaton moves. I'll make an example um, shortly. Uh, an important bit to notice is that the automaton states cannot be observed. So these are hidden from the agent. There are equivalent formalization from the literature. I'll not go into this part, but they are largely equivalent. We can discuss them if uh, we are interested later. In this work, we use this one I described with conditional output functions. Um, just a bit of notation. When I write a transition of H and A, then that is a distribution. Uh, if I also pass uh, the next observation, I want to evaluate the distribution over uh, that observation, I want the probability, just like we do in MDPs for T, S, A, S prime. So let's go on with the example and let's understand how they work. So let's take an example from the literature, from this paper by Tori Carte. That's a POMDP. So there's this agent moving between rooms. Here there's a button that the agent can press. Um, upon pressing the button, a cookie appears either here or here with 50% probability. But the agent cannot see the whole state of the environment. It can only see the color of the room it occupies and whether there's a cookie or not, where it is. Although it's a POMDP, we can model it with an RDP as well, um, where we have, we could represent it with a component generating the room and a component that generates the cookie. The room is actually um, an MDP, and we can have an associated RDP component like this. So these ones are the conditional outputs. So we are in the blue state, we pass the action right, going to the right room, and this is the line associated. And the associated output function tells us that the next observation is the white room. So we generate white. This white is red into the automaton so that it triggers the associated transition. So we go right, generate white, and trigger this one here. So the next state Q is this one. And it goes, like, goes on like this. The interesting bit is the cookie component. This one can be produced with another automaton that we can compose later, where at the beginning, we are in this state. That means there's no cookie. So for any action, no cookie deterministically. Then if we have pushed the button in the orange room, we go into an uncertain state where a cookie might appear um, as soon as we enter one of the two rooms. In fact, if we are in the blue room or the green one, for any action, we might find a cookie with uniform probability. Now, if we generate the cookie for the observation and we are in the blue one, for example, this is the transition. And that means that a cookie is definitely found in the blue room. Here we generate cookie forever until we eat it. That's how it works. Okay, this should give us quite a good um, understanding, but it's a good moment to, to, to make questions for, about, about the model. Yes? Which I do have. Uh... It feels a little bit backwards, uh, this this whole thing that like you have to have a deterministic dynamics. And in the description, when you were describing uh, things, then you were like, oh, the cookie appears randomly here and there. From that, I suppose that the dynamics should be 
you know, there should be an underlying dynamics with two state components, the room component that you're controlling with left up, right, down, uh, and then the cookie component, which you're controlling by pressing the button and eating. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the transition for the second one should be stochastic. And now we see that, like, okay, like, in this case, it's not happening. You can actually rephrase it in terms of, like, deterministic transitions conditioned on your observations. but this seems to be very coincidental and kind of a little bit brittle, like if there were multiple rooms that you could be in and the cookie would be only present in one of them, then maybe this wouldn't work, or I don't like it. It feels a little bit like arbitrary and limiting. Like, what are your thoughts about this? Mm, so are you bothered me, by this, sorry? No, actually, um, no. because... Yeah, so it feels quite general in some sense. So if we think about it, if we want to model the same environment with a PONDP, where we press the button, we have a stochastic transition that places the cookie right. somewhere, right? And uh, from there, it's observed only if we reach the room. Right. Uh, this one works differently. So the cookie is not placed when we press the button, right. uh, but only where we enter a room where the information might be uh, revealed about the cookie. Either the but the blue okay, so can, can we say that this class is equivalent exactly with PAM DPs with deterministic transitions? Um, yes, um, but even okay. um, so, basically, you're saying let's take a PAM DP with deterministic transitions. Mm -hmm. Okay, but not only that those, I understand. Like, yeah, not only those because here. Uh, the cookie appears 50% probability. So we have, okay. if the cookie is in the state, in the hidden state, um, we have a stochastic transition when we generate it. No, no, I'm asking, like, mathematical statement, is it true or not? <laughs> it is. That I'm regular, saying not only that. Regular yeah. MDPs are the same as PUM DPs with deterministic transitions. They contain all of them, but not only. Are they the same? Do they have no. more? They have more. Okay. They have more because this is a, a PUM DP with stochastic transition. There's only Got one it. stochastic transition that it's the one generating the cookie. And but this is also a PUM DP with deterministic transitions. The transitions are exactly according to the state automaton, and the observations are exactly like you say. This is also yeah. a PUM DP with deterministic transitions. So this is not a PUM DP with not like. Okay, so rephrasing. If you take a regular MDP, can, is it true that I can always represent it? It seems to me true with a pump DP that has deterministic state transitions. Um, that seems right. So it, it looks like right because we have the belief construction and the belief construction has a deterministic transition. Not only uh, that, like uh, you can identify the state space of this PAM DP with the state space of the Moore automaton. And then you could just like, you know, reformulate things. And then it seems that it's right. Like deterministic transition PAM DPs cannot go outside of regular MDPs and regular MDPs cannot go outside of deterministic transition MDPs. So they are basically the same. So you're saying, let's study PAM DPs with deterministic transitions, for those of us who understand a little bit about uh, PAM DPs. Um, um, and, and, okay, you will say other things as well, of course, like, I, I know, uh, but just like at this very, very, like, vintage point of view, th this is what's going on. And there I'm asking whether we should be bothered by that stochastic transitions are really ruled out and, like, you know, I go back and forth between these views, and I think it's an interesting question. Maybe we can discuss it later. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it later because um, I'm not. Um, I need to think about it basically. Okay. Uh, because okay. this this will be yeah. formalized as a stochastic transition. If we can rephrase that deterministic, then is it sufficient to to say that there's an equivalent RDP? Uh, uh -huh. Maybe we'll think about it. Okay. Uh, Elaine um, has a question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it might actually link to the two. So um, in the state where we have the, the partially observable, observable like finite automaton that you have um, mm -hmm. underpinning the, the 
the understanding of whatever room it's in and whatnot. Is it just a finite state machine? Like not with a stack, it's it's just, it can't be recursively defined. It's just, it's you could draw it on a piece of paper and it won't self-reference, none of that. Um, it is a finite state machine with, with some labels on, on the states. Uh, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so it's not context-free, like the underlying thing. It's just regular languages, so. Regular languages, yeah. Okay, so um, if you have like a combinatorial or like a combination of two finite state machines such that they're they, um, depend on one another or or could either could even be independent like in the cookie state. Let's say you have one finite state machine, which is um, cookie, uh, trans goes to cookie, goes to cookie, goes to no cookie. Let's say that there's just four states and you know that many transitions. Um, uh -huh. If you're only making all these observations, or sorry, that in tandem with you know a set of rooms and the room stays fixed, you're making observations on these two systems that both of these uh, state machines are active concurrently. You enter a room, you observe the state of the cookie and the room, etc., and then you make a transition. Um, for the sake of, or for the perspective of the like single shot like case, it could be deterministic uh, from the like the vantage point of the learner. If you go, um, if you make the same number of transitions to the same exact rooms at the same time as you're moving through the state machine of the cookies, right? Let's say you've got four rooms and four states uh -huh. with cookie, 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 no cookie. Then, yeah, yeah. even though they're independent, that would synchronize, you, yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's not problematic. That, would, that might happen as a special case. Uh, in general, that, that uh, this could not may not happen. Um, I I don't see this as a um, general situation, but uh, that could happen. Anyway, this tells me that uh, the model is clear. So maybe I would um, continue, and then right. we'll talk about it a bit more later. Um, so we are using this one from the literature and we do learning on this, offline reinforcement learning. So let's get going a bit. There are online reinforcement learning algorithms for uh, this class of environments, um, uh, for example, these three, but we could be using um, other algorithms. For example, if we talk about expressive power, we have this relationship here. So we could be using any POMDP algorithm and that could solve even uh, all RDPs, any RDP, or even more general ones, very key state representations. But we want to target this class uh, directly and be efficient on that. So an important property for RDPs that we'll be using in the algorithm is regularity, of course, because of uh, regular functions. Um, so we consider poli regular policies. These are policies that do not split states. Basically, they don't decide different actions for a single state. One, one state, one action, or one distribution if it's stochastic. So if two histories map to the same state, there's just one action predicted for the policy. Um, there are nice properties. Any RDP is an optimal policy that is regular. And the probability over the suffix, this is the the, the, the thing that remains of the episode. So the probability distribution over this is uniquely determined by the state. But then we can understand this because of um, the fact that the automaton state is uh, encodes the full information. That's a Markov state for the RDP. So if we know that, uh, then the probability is fixed based um, given the policy as well. These are important properties that can be used to to use uh, to make an MDP reduction. So we can construct an MDP associated to any RDP where we take the hidden state and uh, make them visible. And we have the same output function for the word. The transition function now marginalizes out all the observations. And in this MDP here, the value of policies is preserved. So. Uh, one policy was optimal before in the RDP, one policy will be optimal um, in the uh, MDP reduction. That's a similar principle to uh, the belief construction in PONDPs. So in PONDPs, we, we know we can make 
uh, we put belief states here. We just discard the original observations. They are not equivalent anymore, but we can just compute policies over it. So that's fine. We only learn uh, need about um, be able to predict rewards. And that's the same idea here. So we'll use this concept in the uh, algorithm for the MDP reduction. But remember that this MDP cannot be simulated. We cannot sample from it because we don't know the transition function. We don't know the observation function. So if we want to do that, we'll need to learn uh, these ones. And that's actually the main idea inside the algorithm. So let's describe that first. So we're doing offline RL. So we have a data set of episodes collected from an unknown RDP and an unknown behavior policy. And we want to compute a near optimal policy using the smallest data possible. Now, uh, with respect to offline RL in MDPs, the data set now should be composed of entire episodes. Um, we cannot just split into transitions as they are informative in general, uninformative in general. We need um, the entire strings. So the sample complexity guarantee will tell us the number of episodes that uh, the data set should contain. The uh, content of the paper, the contributions are uh, the fact that we propose uh, an algorithm for flying RL in the setting. We use an automata learning technique to uh, reduce the problem from offline RL in RDPs into classic uh, learning in MDPs. We provide two sample complexity upper bounds for two variants of the algorithm. And we give um, the first sample complexity lower bound for this setting. So let's describe the algorithm. Um, first, as for many papers in uh, finite horizon setting, we will um, assume that the environment is non stationary, so uh, transition might change at each step. And to do so, we, uh, we say that the episodic RDP will generate a stop symbol after exactly H transitions. This causes the, um, the state space to be partitioned into these joint sets, one for each time step, so that we only proceed forward. And clearly, we can um, map any non-stationary MDP with changing transitions and rewards uh, into an RDP with this number of states, for, so S times that the number of time steps. So that's a very simple mapping. So here's the full procedure. Um, we have very few inputs, really, just the data set, uh, failure probability, uh, the accuracy parameter and an optional lap bound on a number of states. So the idea is we split the data set into two halves, D1 and D2. We use D1 for reconstructing the unknown RDP. That's what the automaton learner does. This uh, is the transition function of the RDP that was unknown before. And we use it to transform D2 now into uh, another data set. Basically, we throw out all the observations and we place the hidden states that now can be simulated through the transition function that we found. So D2 prime can now be regarded as being generated by an MDP fully. And we can just call our um, offline RL algorithm of choice to estimate um, the policy. And that's it. So it's a two phases um, algorithm. Clearly, the main content is within the automaton learner here. So let's discuss it now. Yeah, I see a question before I change slide. Yeah, so in D2, you, you separated D into two data sets. In D2, all the observations are replaced. So mm -hmm. uh, what if there are two observations of identical histories, let's say, and one of them is replaced, but it, that would be a conflict in the uh, uh, in the data set. So two uh, observations 
two different observations with different histories, you said? Um, no, you, you split the into two data sets. And let's say there's uh -huh. two, uh, in each of those data sets, there is uh -huh. a history that is, the, for, for observational purposes, the same. We have the same history that we are, are looking at in both data sets, uh, except maybe for one transition at the very end, for example. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, if we replace all the observations in D2, including uh, a conflict at the very end, is there any like resolution to this? Uh, what do you mean by conflict? Because this observation can be um, generated stochastically, so they will, will be doing estimates, will um, verify that the first half is correct. So this will tell us can, that the function. Can I clarification question? Yeah, like try to clarify. Uh, so, uh -huh, please. like when when the splitting happens, you're splitting along episodes. So some episodes mm -hmm. go in one of the data sets, let's say half. Mm -hmm. The other half goes into the other data set. And the first data set is used to learn a map that maps histories to kind of states. Yeah. And then once you learn that map, this is tau, then you use the second data set. You go through the second data set and very laboriously processing all the histories with mm -hmm. this function tau and introduce sort of like supposed states. And now yeah. you have kind of like an MDP problem for the second data set. And you never look back at the first data set that didn't matter anymore what the first data yeah. set was. You just like keep processing the second data set because now you have, if the first part worked well, then uh, you introduce states and uh, learning from the second state set with an MVP algorithm, which should just be fine. Uh, Ellen, does does this um, clarify? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm wondering if the if this process would know, um, or or if there's some way of it recognizing if there are two identical. Like, let's say you have one transition in D1. And then you have another transition in D2, and by the policy learned in D1, uh, it transitions. There is no policy learning in D1. There is no policy learning in D1. D1 is only used to learn this function tau. Uh, it's oh, an awesome okay. learning. My, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Makes yeah, sense. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, we just use D1 to to find uh, the RDP to find R. Then we use the transition function. Oh, look, the slides do not say that. Like in line two, you use D. Oh, there's a typo. Yeah. Yeah, right, one. right. There should be a one. That should yeah. be D one. Yep. Yes, absolutely. Okay. That clarifies it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> cool. OK, so as you can understand, I'll mainly talk about the automaton learner part the one finding the unknown RDP. So let's spend some slides on that. So uh, maybe an easy question, uh, why learning automata at all? Um, well, because the number of histories is exponential. So we need to forget things. And we so we want to compress information and we do automata learning um, to, do, uh, to do that. Now, the automaton learner, it's an adaptation of an algorithm that is present in literature from this paper by by 2013. Um, this was for generic uh, automaton, stochastic automata, but we use it for finite horizon decision processes and we reanalyze it. Uh, there are small changes, so we call it ADA CTH. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. You said it was for stochastic automaton. Stochastic in the sense of transitions or outputs? They are very similar to RDPs because they generate stochastic outputs, but they have uh, deterministic transitions. So they are PDFA, probabilistic, deterministic, finite automata. So they are very similar to... So the transitions power. are still not stochastic? Okay. No. Okay. So they map very well. Okay, let's describe how this works. Um, because the, the states are uh, partitioned into layers, we can iterate from zero to H, uh, solve a layer and then 
uh, go forward the next time step. Suppose we are in iteration three and we are trying to uh, solve this layer. Now, um, the circles are safe states. So these are learned and not changed anymore. But the square nodes are candidates. So they will be compared against safe, safe states and merged or declared distinct. So basically is a state merging algorithm. So we uh, test this one, for example, against uh, the only safe state in this case, uh, or this one. If they look same, they will be merged and we modify the transition to, to unify them. If they look different, they will be declared safe. Now, what does it mean to look different? Uh, the comparison is made basically um, depending on the distribution that they induce over the suffixes. So uh, if we are in a state Q and also the policy is given, the behavior policy, uh, it's not given, we don't know it, but it's fixed. Then um, there is a probability distribution over the remaining part of the episode. We compare it against the other state, which might be a safe one, and we compute a difference basically, or, or we apply other metrics. Um, there's a hat here because we need to use um, empirical estimates, of course. So for computing the estimates, here we can see that the probability over, uh, of an episode in a state Q is written like this, P of Q. Um, and the hat is the empirical estimate. This is just the, um, the proportion of episodes that are equal to that uh, input in the data set that is associated to this state. That's very simple. So basically, um, this is a local data set where we collect all the histories that led to that state. So if we are analyzing QT, we have um, we know that the history led to that state and we only keep the suffix ET and we put it into the, um, the data set because we use it for the estimates. So I hope that's clear how uh, the this set is populated. Basically, we, we simulate a transition function that is known up to the current moment because we know the previous layers already. Um, we eliminate the first time steps. We keep the rest and add them to the local uh, data set. Now we just need to compare different empirical estimates. Um, we do that um, with um, different metrics. We could use L infinity, L1, but following other papers, we adopt the L infinity over prefixes. So the only difference with respect to L infinity is that we take the max over the support of the distribution, but we don't not only take this max, but we only maximize over the suffix length. So basically what we do is to have the difference in probability over the immediate observation, then over strings of length two, length three, and we take the maximum over all this maximization, over length and over uh, individual suffixes. Um, there could be a variant where we have the L1, where we are summing uh, these probabilities as well. But for the algorithm, we use this one here. So, wait, uh, uh, yeah. What's the what's the meaning of the upper index p? It just to mean the prefix because it's um, maximizing over length as well. So, it's the one doing the max over length one, length two, length three, and then also over the um, the strings as well. Okay, so you first choose U. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when comparing right. two distributions, but like, isn't this just like another way of writing the L infinity norm? Like, how is this different from just the normal L infinity norm? If you take histories of all lengths, or like, yeah, like, mm -hmm. why is it different? Is this, um, uh, what's the, okay, so maybe the meaning of P. E star, what's the meaning of that? Like there's the probability yes. under the distribution P of any continuation of E uh, up to some lengths or 
or up to age or yeah so um e so these is are the prefix probability okay i see it's like the prefix probability distribution l infinity distance okay yeah oh, i see okay because that's only a distribution given given the length right so um, we set the length and we compute the max the l infinity over that length right and we take and this is over i mean like what other choice would you have if you have l infinity um if you want l infinity like what do you even have some other choice sort of okay right it's one of the few i'm thinking out like uh, maybe one of the few reasonable ones actually because um we have the distribution for length one a distribution for length two right like what do you do mm. it's like you just take the max over everything okay yeah okay okay so Basically, I described the algorithm already. So um, this content here is just just the um, explicit thing. Um, we right. iterate from zero to h. We create candidate states for each continuation. That means, given some states, we append actions and observations, all of them. Um, we populate the data set for them. That's only initializing a first safe state. So it's just um, saying, selecting one candidate, saying this one is safe to start. And then we iterate for all candidates and test them against safe states for that layer. So the set of similar states will contain the safe states that look similar to um, the candidate we are considering mm -hmm. according to this test. I'll go into that later. So if nothing looks similar, then this is declared as safe. Um, if this looks similar to some Q prime, these are merged and the states are unified. Uh, this data set, sorry. So the one we use for estimates. And that's it. So we need to talk about the test here. How do we compare actual states? So we know we need to test the empirical distributions over suffixes with the L infinity prefix, but we do need some um, in, uh, some interval here, and that's the expression explicitly. Now, if two states are um, actually the same, they should be merged. This one would return false if the bound is correct, but if they are distinct, they should have different distributions. Otherwise, they will be merged. Think, so can you go back why... uh, to the mm -hmm. previous slide? I, I want to see how this is called. So it's called with the example. So X, Q, A, O, and whatnot. It's a sequence. It's a it's a bunch of sequences. Yeah. Q... By the way, Addis. Huh? Yeah. I'm just saying. Q uh, AO is just the name of a candidate state. It's the continuation from Q with okay. A and this, O. This thing that's calligraphic X parenthesis X uh, parenthesis Q A O. What is that? That's a list of um, different um, sequences. X, yeah, X of Q A O is the set of suffixes associated to the candidate named Q A O. So the one that continues from Q with the action and observation AO. And X of QAO just means all the suffixes for it. Right, all the possible continuations up to the end? All the things we found in the input data set. So not all so of it's, them. But it's also restricted to the input data set? Yeah, it's populated I from D, yeah. C. Right, right, OK. So is this is this a set or is this a list? So if you find two of these et plus one h to be the same, are they going to be merged into one? It's it's a list. It's a list it's because a list. we can, we'll yeah. count the frequencies. Yeah. It's not not actually a set. Okay. No. It's so a, these are lists. So so these are the basically the training data or whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. The okay. training data for the individual states. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, 
um, so the test will compare um, the empirical distributions against uh, this bound, but we need an assumption. So um, if two states in the RDP are distinct, we want them to look distinct in this distribution over suffixes. So if two states are different, they must have different uh, distribution. That's why we add an assumption that is using a concept named distinguishability. So this is also comes from the um, automata learning literature. And it depends on the metric that we're using. For us, this will be the L infinity over prefixes. And it's basically saying that we uh, introduce this parameter, mu zero, which is the minimum over all distances. So um, over all Q and Q prime distinct and all episode suffixes. So the minimum distance is mu zero. The assumption says this one should be positive. This is an assumption on the behavior policy. That means if two states are different, the behavior policy should take actions that reveal the difference. So they, they might they should cause the observa the different observation to come up in the data set. Mm -hmm. And that's the first parameter that will appear in the bound. The second one is um, a constructability coefficient. Um, this is a bit less surprising because it shows up in offline RL for MDPs as well. So for MDPs, this is the maximum ratio over the occupancy measures. That is the probability of, of seeing a state and an action. Here I'm writing observations to be consistent. Um, and we take the maximum of this ratio. And that's, that's a very useful parameter. That's a single policy because we only care about the optimal policy here at the numerator. And I just want to say that uh, in many algorithms, this, this appears at the numerator um, at the first power. So that's how it appears often. For RDPs, we extend this concept in a very natural way. So we define a single policy constructability coefficient for RDPs as a similar ratio, but for hidden states. So we don't care about observations now, but we do the ratio from the beaver, beaver policy and optimal policy for hidden states. Um, a quite intuitive property, but quite uh, desirable, is that if we have the RDP coefficient, CR star, and then we do the data set transformation from D2 to D2 prime, then this will become the MDP concentrability coefficient. So that would be useful for sure. um, the analysis. Good. We're now ready to um, talk about the um, two upper bounds. So um, this is the first one. Essentially, um, we give in the data set, the RDP is unknown, the behavior policy is unknown. If the behavior policy is exploratory, so that means it reaches all states Q and tries all actions A, then with high probability, the output of the automaton learner returns the true transition function, the correct one, of the unknown RDP, uh, provided that we have enough um, episodes, and this number is this one here. Now, if we look at the right thing, we have the main components, so we can look at it. Uh, we have horizon here. At the denominator, we have the L infinity distinguishability, because that's the one we are using. It appears at the denominator. And here we have the minimum probability of reaching a state under the behavior policy, a state and an action and observation. So if we think about it a bit more, this gives us also an implicit dependency on states and actions, observations at the numerator, because this number can be at most one over QAO. But I'll talk about this parameter uh, later on because we have the second bound to address uh, this one and remove the dependency for it. But for now, let's stick with this uh, with this first bound. So 
because we have an algorithm that is composed of two stages, a reduction step and then um, NDP learner, learning, we can just sum, combine the two sample complexities. This one is for the automaton learner, and this one is for the offline reinforcement learning algorithm. This changes depending on the one uh, we use. Again, if you use as an example, uh, subsampled VI uh, lower confidence bound, we have this number uh, for the MDP part. Um, here, the hidden states appear and the concentrability for the RTP as well. Okay, just a couple of words quickly on the proof. Um, essentially, the core of the proof is testing that this function is not making mistakes, so not introducing false positive, false negatives. So we have a lemma for the case where we have um, two equal distributions. So if they are the same, this one should return false with a probability. And this holds true because we use uh, Hofting's inequality to verify that um, the estimation over the probability of the suffixes are correct. I recognize the structure of the of things bound as well here. Uh, but then we use the union bound to um, account for all the suffixes that could happen. That's why we have uh, this expression here. Similarly, we can do the same thing for um, the case that states are different. In this case, by assumption, we know that they have a minimum difference, a minimum distance by the distinguishability parameter like that. Um, in this case, uh, it holds true for the same comparison, but we also need to have a minimum cardinality of the, um, of the data sets. So a good thing is that we have the distinguishability not as an input, because that will be unknown in general, but um, in the bound only. So for concluding the proof, we just need to verify that we reach uh, all states and we populate the data set often enough, so we verify this constraint. And for verify verifying this and the fact that we have accurate estimates uh, for the occupancy distributions, we'll use uh, Bernstein's inequality. I copied the final bound that we get here. I think it's a good moment to uh, compare with some related work from uh, for similar problems. Um, for example, again, for RDPs, there are these works. Uh, they introduce some concepts that we're using, such as automata learning, but they don't provide sample complexity guarantees as an expression as we do here. Then there is this paper uh, from which we take uh, and adapt the automaton learner. But if this is online, but if we would directly instantiate their bound, we would find a dependency of this order here. Uh, this is quite large. And then we might talk about uh, algorithms that are even more general, as I talked about, like uh, I said before, we could do PomDP learning over RDPs and more general classes. But we can talk about this if uh, we are interested. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good moment to move to the second bound. As we know, we have this one here that's uh, valid already, but um, there's this parameter which might get very low if some state could, is very unlikely to be reached either under the behavior policy or in general. So we want to get rid of that. Basically, the intuition is that we don't need to learn all the states, but only the frequent portion of the RDP. So uh, we can have an alternative version of the algorithm of the learn, automaton learner where we have other city HA, A for approximation. In fact, we do not learn all the states. The important line here is six. This one tests that the frequency or uh, the empirical estimate of the frequency of a state, this is the cardinality of the data set, is large enough. So this, that's a threshold. If this is true, then we learn. So these lines, are just like the previous version of the algorithm, no changes here. If this is false, however, we don't learn anything about these states. We don't estimate anything, 
and uh, these are mapped into a sync state with zero reward. That's the idea. Um, in fact, this allows us to have a second bound where we don't have the minimum occupancy distribution of a state, the minimum probability of reaching that, because this is clamped using that threshold. In fact, we will see appearing um, the one we used for uh, the threshold at the numerator this time. And this has a much nicer form. Um, although we notice that uh, we need two upper bounds in input of the algorithm, so we do require a bit of additional knowledge with respect to the previous version on the number of automons on state and on the num on the consentability coefficient. This is for choosing the correct threshold. Okay, as before, a couple of words about the proof. Essentially, the difference is that now we should verify that the threshold is correct. So a state is frequent if uh, it's higher than a threshold. Um, if this is true, the proof continues as in the previous theorem. But if this is false, we do not learn. So we need to verify that the value that we are losing for not learning is bounded. So uh, we will say that if this number is lower than this threshold, uh, the true occupancy should also be low, um, very low. This concentration is verified against uh, again using Bernstein's. And uh, by summing all true occupancies this time, we will verify that the sum of value losses that we can accumulate is at most epsilon, epsilon half. And that's the main idea. The last contribution of the paper is the sample complexity lower bound. So this is the expression. Basically, we have um, a bound that depends on consistability coefficient, horizon, um, near optimality, and a distinguishability parameter. This time, we have an L1 distinguishability over prefixes. It's not the same as the upper bound. It's a bit larger, but it's still defined as a distinguishability. <laughs> Here, uh, this just says that if the data set doesn't scale with these parameters, we can construct an instance, an RDP, um, um, for which um, the any RL algorithm returning non-Markovian deterministic policies will not be epsilon optimal with, with not negligible probability. So that's the lower bound for the data set size that we require. This is made of two components. The right one is for uh, is in common with other um, with MDPs and bandits um, as well. So we don't actually there's an there's a horizon. So let's talk about MDPs, but it's not new. So um, I'll only talk about the left one. The left one encodes uh, the temporal complexity. So how hard it is to learn a complex transition function for the RDP. So we should find a complex uh, transition function, right? And the one we identified is um, comes from the literature again, and it's called uh, a parity function. A parity function computes the sum uh, modulo two of the of an input string of bits. So we just count the bits, um, but we only consider some of the bits of the input string. In fact, we have an hidden code x, which is basically a selector of the bits we want to consider. So we multiply bitwise from the input with the code, so to discard all the um, all the zeros for the input, and then we do the addition. So that's a complex dependency already, but we can make it noisy by creating a new function that returns the true parity uh, with some positive bias but the, um, the false parity otherwise. So the parity problem is finding the hidden code from samples of these functions. Um, essentially, we, we want to encode this one as an RDP. Uh, for complexity, we'll be using um, results from the literature that we state as a, as a lemma here that says that 
any algorithm solving noisy parity, so finding um, the byte string, the code, uh, must require an exponential number of uh, strings, of attempts, or it should scale inversely proportional to this parameter here. So this one is the noise, is the positive bias. So the smaller, uh, the more complex it becomes. And the numerator is L, the code length, so the number of bits uh, of the code we want to recover. So we should take the minimum of this too, right? Like yes, the yeah. Like basically, um, usually like mm, this one goes minimum, but then if noise is really too low, basically we can just try all of them um, and go right. exponential. So the the class of RDPs, um, Alan? yeah, Alan. Sorry, maybe, maybe I misheard. So uh, it returns f x y with a probability of a half plus this bias, um, but that has a negative impact on this lower bound. Um, so if c goes uh, becomes smaller and smaller, uh, that's on the denominator. So the uh, we need do need more samples. So it right. works so if less. pi is zero point five, then you get back the mm -hmm. noiseless parity. If it's close to zero, then it's very noisy. Yeah. Okay. So I must have misheard then. Sorry, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. What's a streaming algorithm in this context? It's one um, receiving um, receiving inputs and not using them back. So it's quite different from the one we have using data set. The streaming right. one is using data set samples one, once. So if that is important in this lemma, how are you going to use this lemma? Yeah, basically, um, we are reducing the problem of, uh, of one into the other. So if we could have um, um, an offline array algorithm that is good in the policy we are going, in the RDP we are going to construct, Right. Then we can use this uh, offline RL learner as a streaming algorithm. What if that algorithm is doing crazy stuff? Okay, you will see. Okay, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, basically, the, the optimal policy for the RDP would solve uh, this problem, this parity problem. So it's a, it's a backward reaction. I see. So we need to encode uh, parity as an, as an RDP class. Um, here I will show um, an RDP, that's the structure. So the two top rows uh, encode parity. And um, this, uh, this um, example is for the code 101. If we see, in fact, the first parity matters, so it splits uh, depending on the first bit. The second bit doesn't matter, so it rem parity remains like that. The last bit matters, so a one flips parity. So that's really a one o one transition function. From here, um, the optimal action at the top state is a one, at the bottom state is a two, so a zero a one. But they are different. So if an agent wants to be optimal in this uh, top branches, it really needs to know the code and know the, the, the parity uh, that we are after three steps. The bottom branch is basically doing nothing up to here where we have a bandit. So I won't discuss that. And these are rewarding states. So the main idea is that if we want to be near optimal with a small epsilon, we should solve both problem uh, being near optimal at the bandit and near optimal at these top branches. But be, being near optimal here means that we can uh, simulate parity in order to pick A1 or A2 as, an op, as a final action. And that's the uh, main idea. So we pick a small epsilon, we want to be optimal in both. And that means that we know we should find the best arm in the bandit and the parity code as well. To, to conclude the proof, we just need to relate the noise parameter to some distinguishability. And for us, that will be the L1 over prefixes. And that concludes the proof.
So I'm wrapping up here, I'm concluding. Um, so I described the algorithm um, and offline array algorithms for, um, for RDPs. We have two variants, an exact um, algorithm that uses very little input knowledge and uh, an approximate variant. And they have two upper bounds associated. And we provide the first sample complexity lower bound for this setting. There are many possible directions from here. We could uh, implement it. Um, that's very interesting, actually, because the computational complexity is very low. It goes from zero to age, uh, um, tries all candidates, but just once, so it's very low. Yeah, we can right. talk about online RL as well. Uh, then there is a gap between the upper and lower bounds, uh, mainly in the distinguishability parameter that uh, should be investigated. And we could think about alternative parameterizations. Let's conclude uh, my part, and I'll be happy to take questions now. Okay. Questions? So are you saying that the only gap between upper and lower bounds are in terms of this distinguishability parameter? No, there are other gaps too. But yeah, let's go oh, back to comparing this lower and upper bounds, maybe. Yeah. So um like there is no number lower. of states. Yeah. There's no actions, observations. Um, right. For example, the actions would be quite easy to, to extend. We have in the bottom branch, we have a bandit, but the bandit has two actions. So actually, if mm -hmm. we would, uh, if we extend it to uh, yeah, many I actions, we would add an A on the right, right. fractions at most, at least. Um, H is to the second power here, maybe. Um, Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, I think maybe that's um, mostly it. Maybe we have an H, A missing, O. Um, L infinity is quite, uh, it's quite different from L1. So right. I think that's- Can we go to the upper bound? Yeah, let me, I... let me see. Mm -hmm. Do, 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 do. Like the second one, I think it's a bit more interesting. That's the first. Yeah, yeah this one. And so that's only for the uh, modeler. So it's multiplicative. It's one over epsilon, not one over epsilon squared. How is that? Yeah, this one is only for the uh, first phase, so the automata learning. Um, the MDP learning would have epsilon square. Um, okay. I had this one uh, here, for example, this one would be for the um, MDP learning part. So in the right, right direction, for example, we could have this. So there's an H cube, a Q. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quite a few differences. Also, I was wondering whether like the algorithm in the second one, you had some condition that state should be sufficiently sampled, and then you try to apply the uh, the merging algorithm, and if it's not sufficiently sampled, then you're not. And I was wondering, like, if we don't, yeah. Like, I also noticed that the Q bar is initialized to something exponential in the horizon if you don't have an estimate of the number of states. And uh -huh. here you're uh -huh. comparing with uh, Q bar. Although if Q bar is bigger, then it's getting better. Oh, okay. This is this the is second variant. What? Yeah, second variant. Okay. So if Q bar, like if you have a large number of states, then your requirement is weaker? Um, 
my requirement in the terms of um, like what constitutes a frequently sampled state mm. like line six yeah many states I can make q bar very large i can make q bar very large yeah and then and then that will make me want to run the algorithm and merge so that tells me that okay like if in the underlying problem somehow there is a lot of states then it's i'm more likely than to do the right thing um, what's the intuition there yeah so if q bar is large this will be true almost always so yeah. we'll basically we will never learn all of them right it seems like it's happening pretty much all the time yeah it's like spreading the probability evenly over um, the state so the algorithm thinks maybe they are all relevant in a similar way uh if, if, if transitions are uniform for example uh, so this only matters if some states are frequent and some are uh, rare if we do the upper bound uh, larger basically we are pushing the this, this fraction lower for all of them we need to learn even more of them yeah mm -hmm. that looks right mm -hmm. okay cool any other questions do you have some other questions but i also want to give other people room right so when you were presenting the argotum I was trying to think about like how these empirical distributions are going to look like that you're comparing mm -hmm. at the end with this test. And somehow I had the feeling that like we will have very few data and like they're going to be just like zeros and ones and like nothing really repeats. It's like, yeah, mm, I, I got really worried about that. But then it seems that the bounds are not supporting that. But but I don't know where my intuition is going wrong. Um, well, I, I see what you mean, actually, but I don't know what this should cause in, in the bound. Like, I see the problem, uh -huh. uh, but is this bound really, really, uh, really restrictive on that? Like, is it a low number or is it quite... Uh, um large enough number let me look at i mean the bond is uh is awesome it's not not really bad yeah uh, yeah okay. maybe because maybe it's the the, you're computing the distances between these empirical distributions that kind of like clashes things or i don't know so yeah because we the, the sparsity is on the number of uh, suffixes, no? Uh, there are yeah. so many of them. Yeah. Okay. Alessandro, uh, you have some comment? I just like some intuition if it can help. I think so. So you worry that like you have the impression that data gets uh, sparse right towards the yeah. end. So right. the, the thing is that we at each level we know that we don't have many states. Like okay. we have these layers, right? Yeah. Sure. So all the traces, all the strings, always partition into this right, right. on the number but of states. Somehow, like the comparison that, like this test, is not really using any properties of these distributions. Like the test is developed for the general case. It's based on Hoeveling's inequality, uh, the way I understood it. Uh, so I don't see the relevance of that everything collapses and i don't know like it feels still i don't know i'm not surprised but but maybe it's the way the distances are called i don't know 
Yeah. Uh, so basically, we want um, we don't need to estimate all the probabilities of all, all the surfaces yeah. well, yeah. well, right? We, we're yeah. doing the math. So if there's a dif if there's a difference, we want to find it. Yeah. Uh, um, so that looks like sparse condition. Uh, but then this number of uh, suffixes, which is large, is exponential, only goes yeah. when, we, when we're using the union bound. So that goes into the log. That's why we have the H outside here. So we don't get much of, of a blow up. Uh, but apart from this, I don't, I don't know. But when I'm calculating the distance, like I feel that like I will always have like maximum distance, like. Mm -hmm. Once and zeros taking the difference, it's like I end up with one, but yeah, that must not be the case. Yeah, that's interesting, okay. really. Anyways, all right, maybe that's for me too. Oh, thanks for the question. Go back, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, all right, it's it's very nice work. So, Thank you. um you didn't talk about how these results relate to other existing results. Mm -hmm. Like if you try to instantiate more general bonds from the literature, yeah. and here like we had some papers, so the people had papers and so on and so forth. Um, what would you what would those papers get? And mm -hmm. and how would you these algorithms compared to these more general cases if if there are something that's comparable you know like you can take the intersection of the two problem settings where like the more mm -hmm. general thing still applies i don't know whether it always applies like this uh this mu not uh being positive is, is very similar to the condition that's used in the more general palm deep literature it's like this state revealing thing um, um state revealing okay um so let me try to answer okay. that we had um where's the slide with orders so um so there are more general um uh, algorithms so if we think about generic non markov and decision processes arbitrary dynamics uh, they are for PSRs or general classes. Um, the one I saw, at least, uh, I uh, scale with the number of models that they consider. So they have this uh, number of hypotheses, number of uh, decision processes they should identify. So it's one, uh, it's one decision process over n, let's say. And in that case, the bound would scale over uh, with respect to this number. Um, but there are a lot of uh, RDPs, for example, given that we have some number of states, Q, we would have an exponential number of possible transitions. So by enabling instantiating these kind of bounds, probably we would probably we would get some exponential dependency on the number of RDP states because there are so so much uh, so many number of hypotheses. We on DPs, we could get a bit more, more closer to the one we need. Uh, but in Pondy uh, I saw quite um, a large number of assumptions that restrict uh, the model that they consider. Uh, for example, they are revealing um, of the underlying state. They provide some positive information. Don't you have the revealing condition with the MUNAT? Uh, no, um, if I agree with you with what that really means, but not because mu zero consider all the way up to the end. So uh, we could reveal nothing for an arbitrary number of time steps. Nothing about the no. The uh, revealing uh, assumption just means that there exists a, a sequence of actions such mm -hmm. that uh, if you join all the observations. For with that you get when you're executing that sequence of actions, no matter what the initial belief was or like the initial state was, then this suffices to uh, reconstruct the state. Okay. Uh, so with that, like in your model, uh, if I have the mu naught, then I can always navigate to some state with taking some actions. It's basically the diameter of the the model, right? Like you have a finite state space. Uh, I can navigate to the state where I will see the difference. 
So uh, the diameter of the model definitely is an upper bound on, on the length. So, so the revealing condition, I think, is going to be met. Mm -hmm. I, I see what you mean. Um, if, if I understand the condition, uh, we are not assuming this one here because it's completely possible that um, the agent can do irreversible actions or some actions um, is revealed once in the episode and then nothing is told to, um, to get Yeah, that's again. not the assumption that's used in these works. The assumption well, used mm -hmm. is that the underlying PAMDP is such that no matter where you start, so there exists a sequence of actions mm -hmm. for the probability distribution, so it's like, that's like open loop control, that yeah. you execute for some number of steps, you collect all the observations, and this distinguishes between different initial states. That's the assumption. It's I not see. about like what's in the data set or anything like that. It's about the class of problems. I think you have like your your model is going to satisfy this. Um so uh, because I can take random actions for a while. And I wander around and I'm going to hit this positive probability eventually all the states. And because you have the mu naught, like that creates enough signals so that I can see the differences between initial states. I don't know how exactly it translates, but hmm. I think it will be mad. We Maybe do. in future work to, to figure this out. I, th I think you, you might be right. Um, maybe. Um... Uh, nasty example I'm thinking okay. of is um, where um, the, 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 the belief could be reset, like we could discover the information with some sequence of actions, no? So there's a, let's say, there's a, this winning sequence of actions that discovers mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. the true hidden state. But when we execute it, we also get punished and the episode, uh, episode ends. So we can reset the belief, but we can also get punished for that and then the episode ends. We can make an example like that. So uh, there's and, no and the... resetting strategy be before uh, getting what? punished. I don't know how getting punished relates to what can be reconstructed based on the sequence of actions. What I mean is that we can create an RDP where we can reconstruct, but then mm -hmm. terminate the episode. Sure, and? And um, we cannot use this, rec this strategy within uh the policy of the algorithm we cannot reset the belief find where it is and then act uh -huh. uh, might discover at the end where it was it might uh, i guess maybe you're also telling me that in many of these works learning happens online and here in your case learning happens in batch and maybe with this revealing condition uh it's not very useful if you have a batch setting uh hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i see i think you're right alessandro so uh this uh just a question about this revealing condition the observation you get do you put them in a set do you see them as a sequence or you just compare the two different sets of observations that you get starting from two states uh, the condition is talking about the joint distribution of the observations. It's just like, you know, like this class of PAMDP satisfies this revealing conditions. If some distribution that you derive from the PAMDP thing satisfies some condition, right? But does it, does it matter? Like you're not putting anything anywhere. It's just like, it's, it's about the distribution of the observation sequence, the joint yeah. distribution. So, so if I get if from one state I get O1 and then O2, and from, and uh -huh. from the other state I get O2 and then O1, with right. the same probability. I mean, like, you, you look at the whole distribution. But distribution over, over se sequences. sequences? Sequences, sequences. Over sequences. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, then, I mean, uh, as far as I understand, seems, seems related, should be, would be interesting to look at it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, so much work to do. Yeah, really. Maybe I'll stop recording now. Yeah, yeah.